Fantastic. So good ideas. Good ideas lead to good research, keeping your eyes open as to what you're finding. It again harkens back to what we learned from Neil Swerdlow this morning. Uh, continuing this session on uh, stress, anxiety, sleep, post-traumatic stress disorder, we're very fortunate to next be turning to Vicki Risbro. She is a professor of psychiatry. She's joined us uh, in uh, 2007. Uh, she's the associate director of neuroscience for stress and mental health and director of the neurocognitive project for uh, the marine uh, res uh, resiliency study, uh, both of those at the VA. Uh, her topic today is going to be uh, translational research, which has been the theme of many this morning, uh, in the efforts to identity mechanisms of PTSD risk, and we all look forward to information on uh, novel treatments. So at first I wanted to thank uh, the committee, Mark and uh, Mark and Abe, for um, giving me the privilege to be able to speak to everyone today uh, about my work. And um, what I wanted to do was really choose something that highlighted, one, I, I needed a theme because it's 15 minutes, so I can't give you too many different projects. Um, but two, that really highlighted what, to me, this uh, working in this department has been all about, which is collaborating with some really amazing people. And I really don't see how I could have done um, these projects uh, without, uh, without many of you here. So I want to thank you uh, first. And I'll be, I'll be shouting out to a couple individuals as I go through. So I'm going to just drop right into the, um, the PTSD story that was really nicely uh, started by, uh, by Murray's talk. Um, and, you know, I, I actually was trained by uh, Mark Geyer, so I also am very interested specifically in domains of um, psychopathology and how the working on these specific domains may tell us more about the biology of, um, of mental health disorders, in particular PTSD. Um, so one of the charges, of course, uh, from NIMH and, and what we've known for a long time is to identify objective, quantifiable phenotypes um, linked to PTSD. Um, and also to identify, in particular for PTSD, where we know we have a catalytic event that actually drives uh, the diagnosis, the trauma, to identify phenotypes linked to the risk versus phenotypes that are linked to the pathology or the development of the pathology and, and symptom maintenance. Um, and also, because of all of my training, um, I want to be able to use translational approaches across species to probe causal mechanisms and examine some novel treatments. Um, so I'm going to, the first project I want to talk about is the Marine Resiliency Study, which was established by uh, Duleen Baker in uh, 2008. And this is a prospective and longitudinal study of PTSD across over 3,000 Marines um, that were assessed both before they went to a combat deployment to Afghanistan or Iraq, and then when they came back about three to six months later. And what we did, there was a four-hour test battery that they went through in terms of assessing psychosocial scales. They went through a clinical evaluation. We also got labs, and we also did quite a bit of psychophysiology testing on them. Um, so that uh, study has really generated a number of uh, risk identifiers for the marine resiliency study, which I'm not going to be able to, to talk about. Um, but uh, you'll see, for example, I think tomorrow from RP Manassian, some work showing that heart rate variability may be uh, important for risk for development of PTSD. But what I'm going to focus on is uh, condition fear, because this has been something I've been working on for a number of, uh, a number of years now. And again, I just want to highlight that the Marine Resiliency uh, team, so that's Duleen, Mark, Caroline Nevergal, who really headed up the, the genetic portion and biomarker portion, um, the late Dan O'Connor, and also Ming Shuang, who worked on the, uh, the gene expression components. So if we get to uh, the domain of interest for me, it's um, is disrupted conditioned fear processes, are they a signature PTSD phenotype? And if they are, how can we use them uh, to understand PTSD biology, the comorbidities um, that may affect PTSD recovery, um, and also potential treatments? So we know with PTSD, re-experiencing and avoidance of trauma memory is a core symptom of PTSD. So the memory of a traumatic event and the, how those memories induce increased uh, fear responses, physiological responses, and avoidance behaviors is, is really core to the diagnosis. Um, and we also know that extinction seems to be a critical component to treatment strategies for PTSD. Exposure therapy is one of the gold standard treatments that are very effective. So 
PTSD symptoms due in part to disruption in either fear conditioning, too much conditioning to trauma cues, or inability to extinguish trauma cues um, may be a, a, a component of, um, of PTSD pathology. And so what I'm going to be talking about are um, some of the, the work from our lab looking at uh, fear conditioning in the lab, um, but also I should say that a number of people have also described um, abnormalities in the threat circuit that underlies fear conditioning uh, phenotypes in, uh, in PTSD. So what we hope is that understanding mechanisms of how conditioning and extinction are disrupted in PTSD will support novel diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. So measuring condition fear in humans is, is actually pretty simple to do. It is associative learning. Um, so what we do, and we did this in over uh, 2,000 uh, Marines up in the desert, um, and 116 <laughs> degree temperatures, um, was with 12 uh, EMG uh, blue boxes that um, what we did is we sat people down um, in front of a TV screen, set them up for eye blink startle response measurement, and we just showed them blue circles and yellow circles. And about 75% of the time when they saw a blue circle, they would get an air blast to the throat. And I should just say, I should thank uh, David Braff, actually, for originally um, telling me when I started to, to start this, this protocol, we were using shock, and he said, Vicky, you know, the PR for going up there and shocking Marines <laughs> or veterans is not good. So I got great PR advice <laughs> from David Braff, so thank you. Um, and so we went with the, the um, air puff, and it really worked really just as well as shock. So it's not painful, but just aversive. And what we look at is, um, in terms of how to measure the threat response, is we measure how much startle reactivity they have in response to the blue circle, in response to the yellow circle, which they never get an air blast, and compare that to a blank screen. And so we see potentiated startle to the CS plus after they've had multiple training trials, and low startle potentiation to the CS minus. Then they go through extinction trials, which is very simply just getting the same stimuli, but no air blast now. And so now the blue is um, no longer predictive of an of, um, a aversive event. And we're able to see the conditioned fear that they show. And this is just normalized for how much conditioned fear they showed during acquisition. You see their conditioned fear goes down as they get more repeated trials. So this is a really simple way to measure um, non-verbally a threat response and fear learning in, uh, in humans. So in the marine resiliency study, what we first did was we looked at the pre-deployment data. And uh, this was in a fairly large uh, group. And um, what we did was we separated people out based on high levels of PTSD symptoms, high levels of general anxiety symptoms or depression symptoms, but without high levels of PTSD symptoms. And what we see in terms of their acquisition of the CS plus and the CS minus is that all of the groups show very good discrimination between the CS plus and the CS minus. Um, so they have less responses to the, the safety signal. However, the PTSD group uh, really didn't. They showed very little Q discrimination. And this has been shown uh, by another of other groups as well. And so it really seems to be um, a fairly consistent phenotype in post-traumatic stress disorder. So then looking at extinction, um, first I'm just going to highlight healthy versus PTSD. And you see the healthies, again, have a nice reduction in how much fear, condition, or ex yeah, fear conditioning they have. And the PTSD subjects, they do decrease, but not to the same levels, and they're not as efficient. They never really get down uh, their fear conditioning as well within the, within the session as, uh, as the healthies do. And um, the anxiety and depression groups really showed no difference from healthies. So that kind of tells us that this seems to be a specific phenotype to PTSD, which is kind of unusual across the mood and anxiety disorders to have a specific um, a behavioral marker like that. So then what we did is we took those people that were healthy at pre-deployment and we went to their clinical assessments post-deployment and separated them out into who ended up developing PTSD after their combat deployment and who ended up developing anxiety. And I should just say we didn't really have enough depression, um, newly formed depression that wasn't also associated with PTSD. So we didn't, we weren't able to look at that group. And what we found was that these, now remember these people, this data is from before combat. So this is before they actually ended up 
with these symptoms. Um, what we see is that this inability to discriminate between the cues was already present in those that went on to develop PTSD. And what we didn't see was in the extinction, I don't show it here, but everybody showed normal extinction. So it looks like the extinction potentially happens after trauma exposure and development uh, of PTSD symptoms, whereas this may be um, a, a pre-risk a, a pre factor. So one of the other things that we were interested in uh, doing was um, we knew that sleep was really important for fear conditioning and extinction uh, from animal work. And we also knew that sleep disruption and insomnia is highly comorbid in, uh, in PTSD patients. We also knew from the marine resiliency study that sleep disturbances predicted uh, increased, develop increased risk for developing uh, PTSD as well as symptom maintenance. So we asked the question of, okay, how does sleep affect this phenotype, fear conditioning and extinction? Is it possible that sleep could be affecting recovery um, as well as potentially inhibit treatment responses such as to extinction-based therapies um, if sleep isn't, uh, isn't treated well? And so this is actually a study that we did with um, Sean Drummond and Sonia Norman and, and Laura Strauss, who was the JDP student at the time. So what we did is we took healthy controls and um, ran them through the sleep lab at the VA. And on their first day, they got the fear acquisition. And so they, they learned to fear the, uh, the blue circle and not the yellow circle. And then what we did was um, we let them either sleep normally in the lab that night or we sleep deprived them. They had to stay awake all night. And so they had to watch movies, get poked by the RAs every now and then, <laughs> and we kept them away. And um, so they went through fear extinction training, and then we gave them 24 hours of normal sleep, um, and then assessed their extinction recall. So here we're asking not so much what is their initial extinction like, but what is their ability to retain the extinction like? And what we found is that that sleep deprivation um, disrupted their ability to retain their uh, extinction training. And I, I didn't want to make this slide too busy, but actually extinction training was pretty similar across deprived and non-deprived. So it really wasn't an encoding issue. It seemed to be a consolidation issue. So we also went on to ask in, um, in the subjects that had normal sleep, well, are there any sleep stages that are more correlated with performance of either CS plus CS minus discrimination or fear extinction? And we found that REM, um, we, we created a latent variable here for REM consolidation across a couple of different REM measures, was the most highly um, correlated. So the more REM efficiency, the better people were able to retain the CS plus versus CS minus upon um, on 24-hour tests, as well as be able to um, extinguish fear. And this was also replicated by Laura Strauss um, in PTSD patients as well. So it isn't just happening in healthy controls, this is also happening in, in PTSD patients. So what we think is that REM and sleep quality may influence response to extinction-based therapies for PTSD. So if you have subjects that are not getting good sleep before they're going to their exposure therapy, you're not gonna get as much retention. And um, Peter Colvinen at the VA is actually testing that hypothesis right now and is, um, is giving sleep treatment before conducting exposure therapy. So we're excited to hear about how that goes. So some ongoing studies based on that work. We got another DOD grant with Sean, who's now at Menashe uh, in Australia, which lets me go to Australia once a year, <laughs> and uh, with Sonia, is now we're looking at actually manipulating different REM, um, or REM stage and, and slow wave sleep stages to really dissect which of the stages are most important for uh, fear conditioning and extinction. And so we're using a tone-based disruption protocol to do that. And Sean is looking at circadian shifts and then, and then also looking at whether he can reverse effects of circadian shifts, which disrupt REM, um, to see if melatonin receptor agonists might actually improve or, or reverse the effects of this uh, REM disruption. And in animals, um, we were funded, and this is an ongoing study with Andre Derivakian, to look at REM disruption um, associated with increased susceptibility to enduring effects of stress and stress-induced drinking in an animal model of post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a predator stress model that we established in the lab, and what we do is a, a cat um, gets to stare and <laughs> sniff and make noises at this poor little guy and the, the poor little mouse in the cage. Um, and we look over many weeks how that changes their behavior, their drinking be behavior, and also their sleep patterns. So um, 
the final uh, project I wanted to talk to you about is sort of the reverse of the coin. So we're trying to figure out with these manipulations what is potentially necessary for um, good fear extinction. And in, in this case, we're trying to see if we can improve fear extinction. And there's really been, a, in the field, there's been a, a very large group um, of people that are looking at how different drugs may be able to be used as adjunctive therapies with um, a behavioral therapy, with exposure therapy. So the idea is, can we find um, cognitive enhancing drugs that you can give during acquisition of extinction or immediately after to facilitate consolidation? And you can actually improve retention of this extinction-based or exposure therapy, or even natural extinction um, that a person goes through just in vivo as they're, they're living their lives. Oh, I should just, pardon me. And so this project, it was Jessica Deslores, my postdoc, Alan Simmons, um, Martin Paulus, and, uh, and Murray Steen. So it, it, it kind of jumped off of some findings of Murray's um, a couple of years ago, showing in a, a pretty small study that um, there were some, some reasonably exciting effect sizes of giving methylphenidate, which is a dopamine transporter, a norepinephrine transporter blocker. And uh, giving daily doses over 12 weeks, they saw some pretty significant reductions in uh, PTSD symptoms. Um, so this was a small study, but it did get us you know, thinking about how um, methylphenidate might, might act. And so what we would did is we went back to the, to the uh, animal lab, and we looked at methylphenidate effects on fear conditioning and extinction in animals. And so mice, you can train very easily to associate a tone with a, a foot shock. And so here you see all of them uh, associating, freezing more and more as they have the CSUS pairing. Um, the next day, what we did is we give them extinction training. So just the same as people, we give them the tone, the CS plus, but now they're not getting the foot shock. And right before that training, we gave them methylphenidate, 10 or 20 milligrams per kilogram. And because it's a stimulant, it has pretty strong effects. So we can't really interpret much what's going on in that particular day. But at day three, um, where there's no drug on board, we can again look at extinction recall. And we see that methylphenidate significantly enhanced the retention of the extinction. They have less conditioned fear. Um, so we wanted to ask, is dopamine transporter or the norepinephrine transporter more important? And so this is data just summing up all the freezing over that extinction recall session. So here's methylphenidate again. But if you take a selective norepinephrine transporter blocker, atomoxetine, you don't see those effects. And these are effects, um, these are doses that are very good at driving at least norepinephrine and dopamine release in the frontal cortex. Um, and however, with GBR12909, which is a dopamine transporter selective in inhibitor, um, you do see similar effects to methylphenidate, which suggests that methylphenidate's actions are through the dopamine transporter. So that's all very nice, but this is animals and this is, um, you know, freezing behavior in response to a stimulant. So what's happening in humans? And so um, working with Martin and Murray, we got the opportunity to um, look at methylphenidate effects on a fear extinction learning in humans. So again, this is fear potentiated startle that we did. They got methylphenidate after acquisition, before extinction training. And here you can see that the methylphenidate treated group had less conditioned fear uh, over the extinction session. So it was potentially promoting extinction learning. And at the same time, Martin had them um, in the magnet, and he was able to show that methylphenidate treatment increased prefrontal cortex activity at the same time decreasing insula activity during this task. And so that indicates that basically the right sort of neural circuit activation patterns are happening to promote extinction, increase cortical and decrease sort of threat circuit activation. So just to sum up, what do these findings mean for novel treatment approaches to PTSD? So one, obviously, we're, we're really interested in understanding more the biological mechanism of something as simple as CS plus, CS minus discrimination, because we might know then um, some potential biological targets for prophylactic or early interventions. Um, also, what are the biological or cognitive approaches that we can use to boost sleep um, to aid trauma recovery and extinction-based therapy? And finally, treatments that boost dopamine signaling in a particular way uh, may be an, a novel strategy for adjunctive treatments with extinction-based therapies. And it's kind of nice to follow up showing that there may be a potential dopaminergic treatment um, that may be effective following uh, Murray's uh, results showing a, you know, genetic, potential genetic uh, links to dopamine signaling in, uh, in this population. 
So to acknowledge, um, these are all the people that I think I managed to, to mention mostly. Um, Cedric Heisick was one of the people that, that was running the, uh, the methylphenidate imaging study, um, and then all of my, uh, my funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you.